Particular evidence bases dominate Australian education. But I'd like to ask the deeper question, why are the evidence summaries of the different organisations contradictory and different? New South Wales and Victoria uh, base their strategies on Hattie's 2009 book, Visible Learning. New South Wales says it's seven what works best with most of the strategies from Hattie's book. Victoria does the same, but it, they're called the 10 high impact strategies, once again, mostly based on Hattie's book. There are major problems with the, these categories. Um, that's one of the first critiques of Hattie's work is that uh, his categorization of various stu studies is rather arbitrary. Um, so something as simple even as feedback, Hattie includes many disparate studies um, that he considers to be relevant to classroom feedback, but a closer look shows that they're not really related at all. And I'll show you that uh, a little bit later. So from 2009, Visible Learning had his top 10 strategies was the top was self-report grades and second Piaget and programs. Uh, in the last year or two, teacher collective efficacy has taken the number one spot. So Hattie bases these rankings on this number, the effect size. The higher the effect size, the higher the, uh, the influence on student achievement, or that's Hattie's claim at least. Um, one of the first peer reviews that looked at Hattie's work criticized him because of the because Hattie included very low quality research. Hattie responded by saying there's no reason to throw out studies automatically because of low quality. Uh, but this quality issue it, uh, is rather a large one um, and does account for many of the differences. The largest organization for educational statistics and summaries is the What Works Clearinghouse funded by the US Education Department. More than 20 or so professors on, on the panel they have a very strict and defined set of quality protocols. Um, the next biggest, I think, is the English Education Endowment Foundation. They do use Hattie's methodology of the meta and meta analysis. They focus on randomized controlled trials and they use a weighting based on student numbers, um, something that Hattie does not do. If we look at the What Works Clearinghouse flowchart for quality studies, they focus on step one, randomized control trials where students are broken into two groups, control and experimental group randomly. They're looking for studies that satisfy that criteria. Uh, if studies don't, they then look for um, what they call baseline equivalence, which is the two groups of students that have been compared have to be equivalent at, on some basic measures. If studies um, don't satisfy either of those, then it gets the lowest rating or it does not meet the quality standards of the What Works Clearinghouse. It's interesting to note most of Hattie's studies would, um, wouldn't satisfy step one and step three. So most would be considered to be very low quality and wouldn't satisfy the what works clearinghouse standards. So that's why you won't see any of Hattie's um, influences on their summary list. The Education Endowment Foundation does focus on randomized controls trials, but does have a major problem with step two, the sample attrition or the high attrition rate of, of students and schools. Um, the summary from the What Works Clearinghouse, it's very different to Hattie's and the Education Endowment Foundation giving moderate and low evidence for most things, although uh, tests and quizzes, sorry, uh, quizzes to re-expose -re students to content, they claim a strong evidence and asking deep explanatory questions like what I'm trying to ask you now, that apparently has strong evidence. The Education Endowment Foundation's top strategies are feedback and metacognition which are similar to Hattie's, although many of Hattie's other top studies, collective teacher efficacy, self-report grades, Piaget in programs, do not even make the E, the EEF list. Um, in fact, over 200 of Hattie's strategies don't make their list. So that is quite a difference. Uh, in addition, the Education Endowment Foundation suggests that an effect size of 1.2 equals a year's growth, whereas Hattie says an effect size of 0.4 equals a year's growth. Once again, a large difference in their claims. There's a group of researchers which are called the cognitive uh, scientists that are mostly looking at motivation, memory, cognition. Um, they also have a, a range of studies. This is one organization called the Deans for Im Impact who, who publish a document called the Science of Learning. That science of learning, you can look it up, is very, very different to Hattie's and the EEF's list. Um, and one of the problems of Australian education is we're missing out on, on the good research 
done by these sorts of scientists. Another example of the problem with Hattie's work is uh, Professor Bergeron did a, uh, a peer review of Hattie's work and called Hattie's work a pseudoscience and a house of cards. And he shows the problem of Hattie's use of correlation studies, which are those top studies, self-report grades, teacher collective efficacy, and so on. Uh, Bergeron uses this example from comparing ice cream consumption with PISA scores, shows the correlation is high, a correlation of 0.7. If you convert that to an effect size, as Hattie often does with his studies, you get the largest effect size in Hattie's book. Um, so Bergeron shows it's really dangerous to use correlation studies to, uh, to try and illustrate cause and effect. Uh, Dylan Williams picked up on all of this and showed that collective teacher efficacy, which is a correlation study, um, the cause and effect relationship of is it collective teacher efficacy that causes high achievement or is it high achievement that causes efficacy shows that um, that question is uh, very difficult to answer with a correlation study. Uh, one of the recent journals has devoted two issues to this question of evidence. Um, education research and evaluation. The key writers are Adrian Simpson, Dylan William, Terry Ridgely. The two issues mostly criticised the technique of Hattie and the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, Dylan William and Adrian Sim Simpson detail problems with mostly comparing effect sizes. Uh, Adrian Simpson uses a good analogy of comparing the sizes of objects on photos and then concluding that the actual size on a photo is the proxy for the actual size. And he shows that if you use that technique, you could conclude that princesses are bigger than elephants. Um, he likens that to, to Hattie's comparing of effect sizes and shows that uh, the only way you can compare such things is if many, many things are the same. In the case of ph photography, it's, it's, you know, the photographer should be the same distance away from the photo, plus a bunch of other things. In the case of comparing effect sizes, the factors of the different studies need to be the same. Um, Simpson details a number of those. We'll look at one of the factors, the test that is used to measure achievement. Now as background, remember um, in becoming popular, Hattie promoted uh, this notion of ranking and comparing effect sizes in his public lectures. This is from 2005 where he ranks using these effect sizes, and this is called his disaster slides, where probably he got a bit of attention by claiming class size is a disaster with this low effect size. Um, Simpson and Dylan Williams show that the test that's used to measure the impact or to use to calculate the effect size, even though the, impact, the intervention could be the same, the test can the different tests can deliver a different effect size, often a 500% difference. Um, they use the notion of sensitivity instruction. So when you think about it, it makes a bit of sense that a test close to the instruction yields high effect sizes, where a general test that's not related to the instruction um, doesn't yield a high effect size. Um, and standardized tests uh, re generate even lower effect sizes. So because Hattie doesn't control for that, then there's big question marks as, as to what's causing the difference in the effect size. Was it the test or was it the invention? Um, and this in part answers Hattie's switch from those disaster slides now to a more circumspect, um, why is the effect size for class size so small? And one of the reasons is, is because think systemic things like class size or school uniform, um, they're not measured with specific tests, they're measured with standardized tests. So that's one of the reasons why the effect size is so small. Another problem with Hattie's technique is, is averaging a whole meta analysis, analysis using one average. This is one of the three studies Hattie used for class size. It's Gene Glass. Gene Glass actually invented the meta analysis technique and, and warned the results of a meta analysis should not be an average but a graph. Okay, this is the summary of Glass's study on class size. It shows a clear relationship as you decrease class size, achievement increases. And then Glass also shows that the difference between one control, well-controlled and poor-controlled studies is, is pretty major. Hattie neither mentions the graph nor the issue of well-controlled and, and poorly controlled studies. Um, Hattie somehow derives an average effect size to represent that large study of nearly half a million students 
of 0.09. Many peer reviews um, say that that representation of the study is misleading. Another problem is the categorization that I talked about before or the uh, subjective categorization. So something as simple as feedback. These are the studies that had he references in his 2009 appendix on feedback. If you read through the variable, you can straight away see that many of the studies aren't the sorts of feedback that you consider in a classroom. For example, the Stanley study has the lowest effect size of 2.87 in uh, one of the highest effect sizes in Hattie's book, yet it's using music in the background. Um, if we look at that study a little bit more closely, uh, it's using contingent music, which is uh, music that someone prefers um, in a whole range of different settings. Uh, one of the studies looks at uh, depression behavior in elderly folks, and the effect size is looking at it to see if the complaining behavior decreases. So we get um, some large effect sizes. Other studies in this overall meta-analysis show uh, music in the background on a production line. You can see the large disparity of effect sizes. Effect size of 7.6 is huge and some would say almost impossible, um, which confirms Williams and Simpson's analysis that these effect sizes, unless you know how they're being measured, can be dangerous to compare. In the end, I'm trying to just put together a blog so that teachers can have access to these peer review critiques. Given the dominance of Hattie's work in particular, we're missing out on some other really important research, um, which is detrimental to the educational systems. Um, if you'd like to contribute, I've got a blog site that details all the major problems with um, Hattie's work. Um, be happy if you can, can contribute. Thank you.